Section 50 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 50. Jacob Helminger. I was born in Allen County, Ohio in 1839. Enlisted in the service of the United States at Houston, Ohio, August 1, 1862, in Company B, 50th Ohio Infantry was captured at Franklin, Tennessee, November 30, 1864, and confined in the Cahaba prison. The loss of the Sultana on the morning of the 27th day of April, 1865, will remain fresh in the minds of the survivors as long as life lasts. I have seen men shot down in battle, treated like brutes while prisoners of war, but the explosion of the Sultana caused the greatest horror I ever witnessed. In giving my experience in the affair, I will not attempt to give the experience of others, for each one had all he could do to look out for himself. A few of my own company and myself were sleeping on top of the hurricane deck. In my sleep I heard a noise and felt a terrible jar of the boat. In an instant I was wide awake, and before I could realize what had happened, my comrades were also on their feet. Smoke and steam had already taken possession of the boat, and we were not long in perceiving the situation of affairs. I stepped where I could see and looked at my watch, and I think it was about two o'clock. This watch I brought out with me and have it yet. We now saw that the boat was on fire. Many of the injured ones were screaming and groaning. I told my comrades to remain there while I went down on the next floor to see if there was anything we could use as a raft, and if so I would return to them, and we would at once aim to make our escape. I had a great difficulty in getting below, everybody and everything being in the way, and finally after getting there I found nothing but what was already in the hands of someone or thrown overboard with perhaps a hundred men contesting for its possession. I then made my way back to the hurricane deck, but found the boys I had left there gone or scattered, and saw nothing more of them until after daylight, finding all of them at Memphis but one. This was G. W. Shearer of my company. He has never been heard from and can only be accounted for as one among the lost about seventeen hundred brave soldiers that found watery graves. I then saw that none could assist each other, but that each would have to look out for himself, and that I would have to watch my chance and make my escape. To jump into the water just at that time would have been certain death, for the river looked to me like a solid mass of men. Some appeared to be swimming away, others trying to get back to the boat, while others were drowning, and not only themselves, but pulling others under with them. Some were praying, some swearing, while others appeared quite calm and only looking for a favorable opportunity to get away. I heard the captain of the boat giving a command. He told us to come to order, that the hull was not hurt and we would land. Now, if the fire could be put out, I would have thought this order very advisable but I could see no possibility of stopping the flames unless they were quenched by water. The fire had now become so great a person could see a considerable distance each way from the boat. The crowd in the water had also scattered, so I began to muster my courage and prepare to leap overboard. I had great confidence in myself as a swimmer, and hoped to make sure if I was not interfered with by drowning people or getting cramped. All the clothes I had on was my pants, shirt, and socks. This had been my night dress, and I concluded to swim as I was. I was ignorant of the distance to either shore, and thinking, perhaps, it was not over three or four hundred yards either way, I would take the Tennessee shore. I looked for a clear spot and made a final leap. When I came to the surface, I looked around to see if anyone was near me, and seeing there was not, all I had to contend with was the mighty waters of the Mississippi. I now put in my best efforts and pulled for the shore. 
I imagined myself making great speed for a while, but finally noticed I was drifting down below the boat. I could see at once that the current of the river was against me, and thought I would try for the opposite or Arkansas side. This effort was also a defeat. Somehow the current worked against me in this direction more than in the other. I headed down the stream and could see some lights, not knowing what and where they were, and resolved to steer for them. I had not gone far until I noticed an object of some kind in the water ahead of me. I kept my eyes on it, and after a while heard someone talking in that direction, and so called to them. They answered and told me to come to them, so I did my best and after a while caught up with them. It proved to be a large plank capable of holding from four to six men, while there was only two upon it. They invited me on board with them, and of course I accepted. My new companions appeared quite cheerful under the circumstances, and one of them said the lights ahead of us was Memphis, and on nearing them found that our comrade was right. It did not take long for our plank to slide down the river opposite the wharf. A man came to us with a skiff and landed us on shore. It was now daylight, and the wharf was already crowded with people, all anxious to know the cause of the explosion. Of course we could give no reason, or at least I could not, and in fact I did not feel like talking, for I was so benumbed with cold that I felt very little interest in anything or anyone. I have never been a whiskey drinker, but on this occasion drank nearly a pint at a time given me by a ferryboat captain. I am a carpenter by trade. Post office address, New Sharon, Iowa. End of section 50。section 51 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。section 51 。William S. Hill。I was born in Blount County, Tennessee, in the year 1845, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Knoxville, Tennessee, in the fall of 1863, in Company L, 3rd Regiment, Tennessee Cavalry, and was captured at Sulphur Trestle, Alabama, in the fall of 1864, and confined at Cahaba, Alabama. At the time of the explosion of the steamer Sultana, I was blown into the river and floated about nine miles before I was picked up. My present post office is Rockford, Tennessee. End of section 51。section 52 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。section 52 Wiley J. Hodges. I was born in Sevier County, Tennessee, November 4, 1835, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Knoxville, Tennessee, on the 15th day of June, 1863, in Company F, 3rd Regiment, Tennessee Cavalry. Was captured at a trestle in Alabama, September 25, 1864, and confined in the prison at Cahaba, Alabama, until the 6th day of March, 1865, when I was taken to Vicksburg for exchange, and was sent up the river on the ill-fated steamer Sultana. My bunk was near the boiler, and on the night of the terrible accident I lay with a blanket over me. I was awakened by the explosion, and found myself covered with burning coals from the furnaces. I was not long in springing to my feet and throwing my burning blanket away and getting away from that locality. I remained on the boat until the fire became uncomfortable when I obtained a plank and throwing it into the river followed after it. I soon found that it was not sufficient to hold me out of the water, so I caught hold of a floating barrel, but after turning it over a few times concluded I did not want it and let it go. I then turned back to the boat and obtained three planks, 
and putting them together held them with my hands and feet and found then that I could keep my head out of water. I floated down the river in this manner until daylight, when I saw two men upon the bank to whom I hallowed for help. They came to my rescue and took me to a house where I remained till a steamer came along and carried me back to Memphis. I was discharged from the service of the United States at Nashville, Tennessee, on the 15th day of June, 1865. My occupation is that of a farmer. End of section 52《Section 53 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 53. P. L. Horn. I was born in the city of Worcester, Wayne County, Ohio, October 24, 1844, and pursue the vocation of a confectioner and baker. I enlisted as a private in Company I of the 102nd Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry at Worcester, Ohio, August 7, 1862. Was captured at Athens, Alabama, September 24, 1864. Was held as prisoner at Cahaba, Alabama, for seven months. Was then released and sent to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where I got on board the steamer Sultana that had sailed from New Orleans, and upon which the eye of an evil planet was resting. At Vicksburg, Mississippi, one of the boilers underwent a process of repairing. We steamed up the river, the vessel running smoothly, and all going merry as a marriage bell. We reached Memphis on the evening of the 26th of April, 1865, where a cargo of sugar was unloaded. Departing thence at about midnight, we pressed up the river and took on coal. While this was going on, I fell asleep. After that, I knew but little and seemed to live a thousand years in a minute. My first conception or self-identification was that I was lost in the air, and true it was. I was whirled in the air. When the explosion took place, I was lying on the left side of the boat, on the cabin guard, at the foot of the stairs that goes up to the hurricane deck. I was either blown through the stairway or thrust out sidewise into the river, but my first consciousness was that of being in the air. When I struck the water I went down twice when, upon rising the second time, I encountered a piece of the wreck which I seized. I think it was part of the cabin guard which was about twenty feet in length by six to eight feet in width. Seven other comrades clung to the wreck upon which we floated down the river, passing the city of Memphis. On the way down in this life-and-death struggle, two of the men, through sheer exhaustion, relinquished their hold, and sinking back into the arms of the cruel river, were drowned. I do not know their names. They were strangers to me. It was now just before daybreak, and the darkness was most terrible but nevertheless we sounded the loudest possible alarm, which was heard by men in a gunboat lying near, and we were picked up by a skiff with three men in it. There were six of us in the boat, and one of them, my bunkmate, Joseph McKelvey, of my company, was scalded from head to foot in the explosion. I was the first one to get into the boat. McKelvey recognized me and said, "'For God's sake, help me in!' I said, "'Is that you?' "'It is,' he replied. I asked, "'Are you hurt?' He answered, "'Yes, scalded from head to foot.' I took him by the arm, and one of the boatmen took hold of him also, and we helped him into the skiff. The boatman removed his coat and put it around McKelvey to prevent him from taking cold. We then started up the river toward Memphis, and when crossing the river in the direction of the Tennessee side, we were then on the Arkansas side, we were fired upon by some Negro guards, Union men, who thought that we were Confederates and who were guarding the river some distance below Fort Pickens. We then headed upstream and met a steamer in anxious search of the victims of the terrible disaster. One of the skiffmen with a lantern signaled the steamer, 
and it came to a halt and we were taken on board. McKelvey was hurt the worst and received the most kind and tender attention. A bed was made on the lower deck for him, his clothing removed and his body sprinkled with flour, if possible to mitigate his sufferings. The dense darkness still prevailed, and the steamer continued its journey down the deep broad current on the alert for victims till after daylight, when it returned to Memphis, not having found any more of the unfortunates. Shortly after we were taken on the steamer, a comrade, stranger to me, died, but prior to his death they placed him on a barrel, and for a time rolled him quite vigorously, thinking that he was gorged with water. When we arrived at Memphis, the ladies of the Sanitary Commission were the first to come to us with dry clothing, giving each of us a flannel shirt and a pair of drawers. We changed our clothing, and then were driven in cabs to the hospital. The unfortunate McKelvey was taken to a different hospital, in some part of the city, where he died. We remained in Memphis two or three days, and those who were able and well enough were transported to Cairo, Illinois, and thence to Columbus, Ohio, where I was discharged from the service May twentieth, 1865. At the time of the explosion, McKelvey and I were lying together asleep, and it is a matter of wonder to me how I escaped when he was so seriously injured. When the explosion took place, my first impression was that I was experiencing another railroad disaster, as I had just passed through an ordeal of that kind on the way to Athens. But when I collided with the water, this impression was soon corrected. How far or how high I was blown into the air, I do not know, but I remember that my feet first struck the water, and with the exception of being slightly hurt on my left side, I suffered but little from the shock. It was not a laughable matter then, but it is now, when during the night we were clinging with a death grip to the wreck, a mule, another floating waif of this disaster, swam along and dumped us all into the river compelling us all to exert our strength to regain our hold on the wreck. The current at times would compel the men to relax their grip, and with the greatest difficulty they would recover it again. It is my opinion that the explosion was caused by a torpedo having been placed in the coal by the Confederates at the last coaling station. One of the boilers of the Sultana had just been repaired at Vicksburg. Many of the men who lost their lives were soldiers who had been prisoners for many months, some even for twenty months. End of section 53。section 54 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。section 54 。Ira B. Horner。I was born in Ohio in 1847. I enlisted in the service of the United States at Findlay, Ohio, October 25, 1861, as a private, in Company K, of the 65th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry, and was promoted to corporal at Nashville, Tennessee. I passed unharmed through all the engagements of my regiment, until at the Battle of Stone River, or Murfreesboro, December 31, 1862, where I was wounded in my left hip and thigh. At Chattanooga, Tennessee, I re-enlisted in the same company and regiment, and as a corporal. During the second term I was most fortunate in escaping sickness and was leading a most charming life, but while in battle at Franklin, Tennessee, November 30, 1864, my good fortune seemed to have forsaken me and the worst of evils befell me. I was a prisoner in the hands of the Confederates. The day following our capture we were placed in a line and searched, and everything that would be of any value to them was taken from us. I had a new pair of boots which I was compelled to exchange for a pair of shoes two sizes too short for me, which had to be cut before I could wear them. I had a watch which I sold as soon as I entered the enemy's line for $150 Confederate money. 
also had thirty-three dollars of our money hidden under the cover of a pocket testament, and as the men who were despoiling me had no use for the latter, it was left in my possession, and the treasure therein became the means of saving the lives of three comrades and myself. I bought one or two bushels of cornmeal, without which it would have been impossible for us to live. When we were to be exchanged, and were passing out of the prison grounds, the monster who had presided over our prison tortures said by way of parting, "'I had rather shoot every one of you than see you exchanged.' The explosion of the steamer Sultana and my escape from a watery grave at first seemed like a horrid dream, but in a short time I learned it was a reality. When first awakened from my slumbers, it seemed as if some poor emaciated comrade had fallen upon me. The next I knew I was struggling and strangling in the water. I was not very well versed in the art of swimming, but fortunately for me a stick of timber came floating along. I grasped it and soon found another, and by the aid of these I thought that there would not be much danger of my drowning. While clinging to the timbers a poor fellow clutched me by the legs, and for fear that he would drown us both I pushed him off letting one of my socks go with him. Probably well I did so, for I should not have been able to have taken him with me. After getting through with this my attention was drawn to a brilliant light. Some comrades asked what light that was. Some said that it was the boat burning, and others that it was a boat coming to our rescue. Although I felt that I would not drown, at the same time I did not feel comfortable from the fact that there was an alligator seven and one-half feet long keeping me company. While floating along on the timbers I heard a familiar voice hallooing to me. "'Horner, is that you?' I answered, "'Yes, what there is left of me.' On my asking him what he was on, he replied on a piece of the hurricane deck of the boat. I asked if it would be sufficient for me to come on with him. "'All right,' he says. "'Horner, come along.' I could not see him, but struck out and soon found him. The craft was only about four by six feet, and two comrades were with him. Less fortunate than myself, they could not swim. My timber was gone, therefore I had to remain. Now there was a squad of four two swimmers and two hangers-on. One poor fellow was badly scalded as well as myself. We floated gently and peacefully along until we came to where the city guards were stationed. They fired upon us, not knowing what was the matter. Soon we arrived in sight of the city lights. I was well aware if we got any help outside of our own efforts we might get in there, so I hallowed with all my strength and soon a party of two with a small boat came to our rescue. I felt like if I had all the world I would give it to those boatmen. They rowed us to a larger boat, the Essex. There the attendants on board gave us something to drink from a canteen which set the blood in circulation, and also something to eat in the shape of hardtack and dried beef. After landing, we marched up to the town of Memphis, I marching along in the city with only one sock, shirt, and drawers on, but we felt fortunate to be alive and free. We were placed in the Gayoso Hospital, where we remained and were cared for about ten days. Before leaving, we donned another suit of blue, then we went on board a boat bound for Cairo, Illinois. On arriving there we felt quite relieved to know that we were off the water. The next morning we went by rail to Mattoon, Illinois, where a bountiful repast was served, and also a ten-dollar note was given to me, which I gave a portion of to my messmates. The word had come that all Ohio soldiers that were able to be transported were to be sent to the state to be mustered out of the service as the war was over. Of course we wanted to go whether able or not, and of course I went, though I went on crutches, being scalded and bruised on the left side, 
and my left shoulder dislocated. We arrived at Columbus at the Seminary Hospital, where we remained three weeks. Then we were mustered out of the service by order of the War Department, May 15, 1865. I arrived home on or about the 18th of May, 1865. The people at home looked on me as one of the dead, as they had learned that I was on the boat, and they did not expect to see me alive again, but they did not know that I had learned to swim since they last saw me. If I had not learned to swim, I should, without any doubt, have drowned. My present occupation is farming. My present post office is Weston, Ohio. End of section 54《 Section 55 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 55 Jacob Horner. I enlisted in the service of the United States on the 14th of August, 1862, for three years at Nashville, Holmes County, Ohio, as a private in Company A, 102nd Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry. I was captured in the engagement before Athens, Alabama, and made a prisoner of war on the 25th of September, 1864, and taken to Cahaba, Alabama, where I remained until the 14th or 15th of March, 1865, when I was paroled out and sent to Vicksburg, Mississippi, arriving there on the 21st of March. I remained there until the 24th of April, when I went on board the steamer Sultana, bound for Cairo, Illinois. We arrived at Memphis, Tennessee on the evening of the 26th of April. On the morning of the 27th of April, the steamer exploded one of her boilers, and there were about 1,450 drowned and killed. My life was saved by swimming about two and a half miles and landing in the brush, the water had risen so high that it had overflowed its banks. As to the cause of this disaster, I never knew. The number of passengers on board, according to what I have learned, was 2,250. This disaster, of which I am writing, was the greatest accident that ever happened during the war, and neither pen nor tongue can describe it. I was discharged from the service at Camp Chase, Ohio, on the 20th of May, 1865. End of section 55《Section 56 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry — This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Section 56 — W. A. Hulled I was born near Lucas, Richland County, Ohio, May 19, 1841, and enlisted at Mansfield, Ohio, October 2, 1861, in Company A, 64th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Was captured near Franklin, Tennessee, November 29, 1864, and confined in the Cahaba, Alabama prison. When the explosion occurred, I was lying near the head of the stairs on the cabin deck, and was suddenly awakened by a terrible crash and nearly smothered with hot steam. I soon realized that a frightful disaster had occurred, and heard the groans of the suffering and cries for help. Hastily making my way down the stairs to the bow of the boat, I found all was confusion. Men were shoving off gangplanks some tearing boards off on which to float, others walking through the crowded deck, seemingly crazed or wringing their hands and calling on God for deliverance. Others were crying, while many were being crowded off into the river by dozens and going down to a watery grave, clasped in each other's embrace. I made my way through the crowd down to the bow of the boat, picking up the hatch door on my way. I dropped it into the water and leaped after it, but, unfortunately for me, three other parties seized and got away with it. That gave me some room, and I got out of the crowd without being hindered by anyone. 
I swam until my strength was about exhausted, when I saw, by the light of the burning vessel, a small cottonwood tree floating near with a man poised in its branches. When it came near enough I caught hold of the roots and held on. As soon as the man saw this he made serious objections, saying that it would not carry two men and that he could not swim a lick, to which I replied, I only wish to rest a minute and I will surrender the tree to you. Slipping my suspenders from my shoulders and extracting myself from my government pants, I applied all my strength to swimming again. In this way I toiled on, fighting the mad waters of the Mississippi, until to my great surprise I saw something in the darkness floating nearby. I struggled towards it and laid my hand on a large plank covered with pitch and gravel, which proved to be a part of the hurricane deck of the Sultana. On this plank I floated for several hours, and as the day dawned on the morning of the 27th of April, 1865, I was picked up by the steamer Bostonia and carried to the city of Memphis, Tennessee. My present occupation is that of a plasterer. Post office address, Armordale, Kansas. End of section 56「Section 57 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 57. John H. James. I was born in Paris, Trumbull County, Ohio, November 13, 1844, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Limaville, Stark County, Ohio, August 11, 1862, in Company F. 115th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Captured near Nashville, Tennessee, December 4, 1864, and confined in the Meridian, Mississippi and Andersonville, Georgia prisons. The first thing I knew of the explosion, I found myself under one of the fallen smokestacks. I cannot tell how I got out. I floated and swam down the river until about sunrise was picked up by a gunboat yawl, more dead than alive. Occupation, wood finisher. Post office address, 707 North Howard Street, Akron, Ohio. End of section 57. Section 58 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 58. C. J. Johnson. I was born in Phillipsburg, Allegheny County, New York, May 18, 1840, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Hudson, Lenawee County, Michigan, August 21, 1862, in Company A, 18th Regiment, Michigan Infantry, and was captured at Athens, Alabama, September 24th, and confined in the Cahaba, Alabama prison. When the explosion took place, I lay between the smokestacks asleep. I remember jumping into the water, but knew no more until about sunrise, when I was picked up on the Arkansas side by the picket boat Pocahontas. Occupation Farming Post Office Address Medina, Lenawee County, Michigan. End of section 58. Section 59 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 59. Lewis Johnson. I was born in Henry County, Indiana, November 1845, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Henry County, Indiana, December 1863, in Company G, 9th Cavalry. Was captured at Sulpha Trestle, Alabama, September 25, 1864, and confined in the Castle Morgan and Cahaba prisons. When the Sultana exploded, I was lying in front of the wheelhouse, I got up and walked across the boat, 
pulled off my clothes, and jumped into the water. I was burned very badly on my neck and shoulders. I swam out to some timbers on the Arkansas side and got on a log. There were nine of us on it. We were there until eight o'clock when we were taken in by a boat. Occupation Farming Post Office Muncie, Indiana End of Section 59《Section 60 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 60. Benjamin F. Johnston. I enlisted on the 16th of August, 1862, at Almont, Lapeer County, Michigan, as a private in Company A of the 5th Regiment Michigan Cavalry mustered in the united states service at detroit on the twenty sixth of august eighteen sixty two and left detroit for washington d c on the sixth of december eighteen sixty two arriving there on the ninth and went into winter quarters on east capitol hill our regiment in the spring joined the army of the potomac and i was taken prisoner on the eleventh of june eighteen sixty four at trevilian station virginia taken first to Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia, and from there to Andersonville, Georgia, where I was confined until the 25th of March, 1865. I was paroled out and sent to Vicksburg, Mississippi, arriving at Black River on the 1st of April, 1865, crossed the river and went into camp, remaining there until the 24th of April, afterwards marching about four miles to Vicksburg, where we went on board the steamer Sultana. My company being near the rear of the column would naturally fall on the lower deck and on the bow of the boat. We arrived at Memphis, Tennessee on the evening of the 28th of April, and the steamer stopped and unloaded 300 hogsheads of sugar, which detained her until nearly 11 o'clock at night left there about that hour and went up the river about four miles where we stopped and took on a supply of coal to last as far as cairo illinois leaving the barges about two o'clock in the morning of the twenty seventh when after steaming up the river three more miles the explosion took place taking in the whole situation at a glance i got up put on my shoes and waited for a favorable opportunity to leave the boat realizing that I was safe on the boat as long as the fire did not affect me. When the opportunity presented itself, I took off my blouse, hat, and shoes, keeping on all my underclothing, and took an amber-type likeness of my wife and boy out of my blouse pocket and put it in my pants pocket, so that if I was lost and ever found, it would be the means of identifying me. I then put my left hand on the railing of the boat and jumped into the river and commenced swimming for the shore. After being in the water a short time, a piece of board, about six inches wide and from six to seven feet long, came floating along in front of me. Having secured it and placed it under my breast, I had no trouble in reaching an island, but on account of high water it was overflown. After a great amount of trouble I finally succeeded in getting out of the river into the fork of a small tree and remained there until eight o'clock when I was picked up by a steamer and taken to the soldier's home at Memphis. Left there the second day for Michigan. Was discharged from the service as a veterinary surgeon at Detroit, July 7, 1865. End of Section 60 Section 61 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 61. A. A. Jones. I was born in Stowe, Summit County, Ohio, on the 25th of April, 1843. Lived with my parents on the farm. Enlisted in the service of the United States, August 11, 1862, 
and mustered into the service September 18, 1862, in Company C of the 115th Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Spent first year of service in the state of Ohio, mostly at Cincinnati, guarding paroled prisoners, looking after Morgan, quelling Vallandigham riots, etc., were ordered to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in the summer of 1863. The regiment was distributed along the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad. Fifty or sixty of my company, myself included, were stationed at Fort Laverne, where we remained until December 5, 1864, when we were unceremoniously taken under General Forrest's wing, who promised us a parole in a very short time. Notwithstanding, we were moved hastily into Dixieland, across Tennessee into Mississippi, and hardly halted until we saw the inside of the filthy enclosure at Meridian, Mississippi, remaining there until the barefoot stragglers came up, feet bleeding and frozen, caused by the ice and snow that lay on the ground at the time. Many a poor fellow went to his long home on account of the cruel treatment of the enemy in taking away his boots and shoes. Arrangements were very soon made to remove us from here, as Pap Thomas was making it rather lively for Hood about this time, and we were moved into Alabama, thence into Georgia, where we went into winter quarters in the most dreaded of all prisons, Andersonville. It must have been the last days of December when we arrived at this den of death. We remained there until the last of March, 1865, when some twenty-five hundred men were sent out on exchange, arriving in camp at Black River, Mississippi, the forepart of April, 1865. Here it was we wrote the happy news to our parents, wives, and sweethearts that we would soon be with them at home. How our hearts leaped within us with anticipation! On the morning of April 25th, the news came that transportation had been secured, and we were marched out with light hearts to Vicksburg, where the Sultana lay awaiting us. It was not at all necessary to be invited to go on board, and as we did so, we noticed the repairing of the boilers. Some twenty-five hundred sandwiched ourselves as best we could until every available spot and place was occupied. The repairs of the boilers, the overcrowded condition of the boat, the drunken captain who furnished transportation made everything blue because the captain of the boat objected to taking on so many. These very important things were unnoticed by the comrades in their anxiety to reach home and friends once more. But the sequel proves we should have been more wary. Near the bow of the hurricane deck was the place selected by our squad who had stuck together through all our afflictions during the war. My health was very poor while at Andersonville. The hurried march into our lines, change of climate and diet, etc., made my case no better. Consequently, I was most miserable when I boarded the vessel, and asked as a favor of my comrades, Martin Baird and Robert Gaylord, if they would permit me to sleep between them as we had only one blanket. They cheerfully consented, and although the nights were quite cold to us bloodless fellows, yet by being so closely packed we managed to keep three sides comparatively warm. This was the position we occupied during the night of the 26th up to the time the crash came, which must have been about 2.30 a.m., what a crash! My God! My blood curdles while I write, and words are inadequate. No tongue or writer's pen can describe it. Such hissing of steam, the crash of the different decks as they came together with the tons of living freight, the falling of the massive smokestacks, the death cry of strong-hearted men caught in every conceivable manner, the red-tongued flames bursting up through the mass of humanity and driving to death's door those who were fortunate enough to live through worse than a dozen deaths in that damnable death pen at Andersonville. We had faced death day by day while incarcerated there, 
but this was far more appalling than any scene through which we had passed awakened with a dreamy whisper of mother sister or other darling on our lips but oh what a change in one short moment comrades imploring each other for assistance that they might escape from the burning deck officers giving orders for the safety of their men women shrieking for help horses neighing mules kicking and making the terrible scene hideous with their awful brays of distress these are a few of the many scenes and sounds that greeted my sight and came to my ear after a most desperate effort on my part i extricated myself from the section of the wreck that by the explosion had been thrown upon me my sleeping comrades alas where were they martin baird that slept on my right and robert gaylord that slept on my left where were they god can answer i cannot as i never saw or heard of either of them after that poor fellows they were kind to me and i trust that i may yet touch elbows with them across the river whose waters are so pure i climbed as rapidly as my strength would permit to the railing on the edge of the boat and from there looked down on the awful scene below the darting flames by this time lighted the whole panorama can i ever forget the scene not while my senses remain masses of drowning men clinging together until they were borne down by their own weight to rise no more alive their poor pinched and ghastly faces are indelibly engraved on my memory life is sweet and all those scenes of destruction did not prevent me from thinking of the dear ones at home and how i was to save my own life i climbed to the lower deck and grasped a plank was sliding it over the edge of the boat when a comrade asked permission to slide down it was granted when he reached the water he caused me to lose my hold then he moved off with it this robbed me of what i first expected to save my own life on but i bear no malice my earnest wish being that the plank he robbed me of saved his life or that of some other comrade I stood wondering what next to do, but as God was watching over me, there was a way that soon proved to me that there was a power ruling over all stronger than man. A plank like the first floated from beneath the swell of the boat. As soon as I noticed it, I sprang into the water, came up, and remained as near the boat as possible. I swam to the bow then swam away as quickly as i could to avoid obstacles being thrown on me as i had observed many a poor comrade pass to his watery grave in this manner after getting a short distance from the boat on the tennessee side there was something i took to be an island as the flames by this time lighted far out on either side i started as i supposed for the island but soon got into the current and it being very swift and the plank large i was swept down at a rapid rate and the water being very cold soon chilling my weak physical structure to such an extent that i gave up all hope of my reaching shore by any exertion of my own so i floated with the current i cannot describe my feelings as i lay motionless on the plank my lower limbs being benumbed and cramped so that i had no power over them i never can forget the scene of horror as i looked upon it the last time those noble men who had faced battle in all its fury who had not flinched when the word forward came even though in the face of the cannon or screaming shell had faced worse than death at andersonville standing there on the bow of that burning boat wringing their hands rushing to and fro begging and imploring their comrades to assist them that their lives might be saved to their dear ones i floated on out of sight and hearing of that terrible picture until life in me was well nigh extinct when i saw in the gray of the morning the street lamps at memphis when i realized this fact i was more horrified than at any time 
for the thought of going beyond that city into the wild region below in that mad rushing current was enough to curdle the blood if any was left in my veins which i doubt for as i remember the sensation that every particle of blood had been forced to the uppermost portion of my brain by a one hundred horsepower engine that the top of my head would fly skyward providence stepped in again in my behalf when i so much needed assistance and hope had well nigh given away i heard the dip of oars and felt a strong hand grasping and raising me from my faithful friend the plank and placing me on the bottom of a boat that was being used to patrol in front of the city to pick up those who were floating down that far i was taken to a wharf boat and as i was borne along by two strong men two women god bless them came forward with a blanket and wrapped it about my naked form comrades will we ever realize what force there was back of the women of our country to aid and assist us in crushing out the life of the cruel war this country owes them much for their untiring zeal patriotism and courage i was taken to the washington hospital as soon as i was able to sit up where we received very kind treatment until we left for the north two days later my present post office is parkman ohio end of section sixty one section sixty two of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section sixty two nicholas carnes i was born in macarthur ohio on the twenty fifth of december eighteen thirty nine i enlisted in the service of the united states august twelfth eighteen sixty one at macarthur ohio as a sergeant in company b of the eighteenth regiment ohio volunteer infantry and mustered into service at camp wool athens county ohio in september eighteen sixty one our regiment being assigned to the army of the cumberland i served under generals buell and rosecrans and consequently was in the battles at stone river and chickamauga was captured on the second day's fight september twentieth eighteen sixty three at chickamauga and was taken with several thousand prisoners to richmond where we were searched and robbed of our valuables i was assigned to the old pemberton building where i remained about two months and then i in company with comrade johnson was taken to libby prison where they confined us in darkness for thirty-six hours we were then taken out and placed on belle isle where we remained the rest of the winter and in the latter part of march eighteen sixty four was taken to andersonville and remained there until september when i was taken out and shipped to millen from there to savannah blackshear thomasville and was finally taken back to andersonville arriving there on the evening of the twenty fourth of december eighteen sixty four we remained there until the latter part of march eighteen sixty five when we were taken out and sent to vicksburg mississippi here i would like to relate about the many happy changes but space will not admit neither can words express it at vicksburg we were put on the ill-fated steamer sultana all went along smoothly until one of her boilers exploded on the morning of the twenty seventh of april eighteen sixty five i was lying on the cabin deck when the explosion took place and with the aid of a number of comrades secured a stage plank and launched it out into the deep rough waters many were forced to let go and were drowned but those that were fortunate stayed with the plank we tried for some time in vain to make to the tennessee shore but the current being against us we were drifted downstream until we lodged in some driftwood that had caught in an old treetop i clambered through the drift until i reached a log where i found a michigan comrade who divided his clothing with me which was the means of saving my life as i was nigh chilled to death 
when daylight came i made my way back to the old stage plank where all hands joined in rowing it to an old shanty and we climbed to the roof and remained there until about nine o'clock a m when the relief boat jenny lind came to our rescue i was then taken to memphis and placed in the hospital where i remained until after i drew my clothing was then taken by boat to cairo illinois and from there by rail to columbus ohio where i was discharged from the service may eleventh eighteen sixty five my present occupation is salesman my present post office is plain city ohio end of section sixty two Section 63 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 63. E. J. Kennedy. I was born in New York City, December 23, 1841, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Cleveland, Ohio, April 1861, in Company E, 7th Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry was captured at Cross Lane, West Virginia, and at Franklin, Tennessee, August 1861 and November 1864, and confined in the following prisons, Libby, New Orleans, Salisbury, and Andersonville. I was sound asleep when the explosion took place, and awoke to find myself in water. I managed to get hold of a piece of the wreck, and in company with one of my comrades, stuck to this for nearly four hours when we were picked up by a gunboat occupation merchant post office address berea ohio end of section sixty three section sixty four of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain Section 64. Renaldon Kimmel. Was born in William Center, Ohio, January 22, 1840, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Farmer, Ohio, September 11, 1861, in Company E, 21st Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Was captured at the Battle of Chickamauga, September 20, 1863, and confined in the following prisons. Pemberton Building, Richmond, Virginia, Dansville, Virginia, Andersonville, Georgia, a prisoner for 18 months and 11 days. He was on board the Sultana when the boiler exploded, and asleep at the time. On awakening, called to his partner Dunafin, who was sleeping with him, but received no reply. Could not swim, and the alternative of burning to death or drowning presented itself. He chose the latter. Securing a small board before leaving the boat, he threw it in and jumped after it, managing to get hold of it when it came to the surface. It helped him through. He was among the first to leave the boat, floated down to Memphis just at daybreak, and was taken from the water nearly lifeless was not in his right mind for several hours. Left Memphis April 29th. Dunafin was never heard from. R. Kimmel died March 25th, 1891. End of section 64. Section 65 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 65. Albert W. King. I was born at Eicherhof, near Wittenberg, Germany, March 6, 1842. Came to Defiance, Ohio, March 1849. Enlisted in Company D, 100th Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry, on July 17, 1862, at Defiance, Ohio. I was with said company and regiment until I was captured at the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, November 30, 1864. In company with several hundred others captured at the same time, was taken south. 
Our first experience in prison was at Meridian, Mississippi. Some time later we were transported to Andersonville, Georgia, where we were exposed to all the weather during the winter months, consequently we suffered intensely. Our best clothes, blankets, and tents had been taken from us when captured. Early in April 1865 we were taken from the stockade and transported to our lines at Big Black River, near Vicksburg, Mississippi, and placed in parole camp. About the same time, large squads of prisoners arrived from Cahaba and other prisons. Here we remained until we were furnished transportation on the steamboat Sultana at Vicksburg. The trip to Memphis was very tedious, though pleasant in spite of the enormous crowd on the boat. We were on our way home, and everybody was cheered by the thought. John Davis, George Hill, William Wheeler, Adgate Fleming and I, all belonging to the same company, occupied a small space on the boiler deck, about twenty feet from the stern of the boat. We arrived at Memphis on the evening of the twenty-sixth. While the boat lay at the wharf, sugar in hogsheads was being unloaded, and we helped. When tired, we went upon the streets of Memphis, but soon returned to the boat, fearing it might leave us. When our steamer left Memphis, we started for our lodging place. Some distance up the river, the steamer made a stop at the coal barges, and a supply of coal was taken on. When the steamer was again under headway, we fell asleep. We had slept about an hour when the crash came. Men, coal, wood, and timbers from the boat were thrown over and beyond us. The steam and ashes smothered us so we could scarcely breathe. Several seconds passed before I recovered sufficiently to know what had happened. When I came to my senses, I rushed for the stern entrance, falling several times before I reached the fresh air. My four companions were soon by my side, having also escaped any serious injury from the explosion. Now hundreds of men came rushing out to get breath jamming and crowding commenced. Those crippled were trampled on. The high-hanging bridge plank crushed many as it was cut down. The lifeboats were cut from their fastenings, but in such an immense crowd amounted to mere nothing. The cabins over the boilers were shattered and torn out, and soon that portion of the boat was on fire. Men called for buckets, but none were left on the boat and in a few minutes later the fire assumed great proportions. Men, women, and children in the cabins called for help. Men jumped from the upper decks to the water below. Hundreds had been blown into the water when the explosion occurred. It was an exciting scene. We could not see how any of us could be rescued. Not a boat in sight. The Tennessee shore was a half mile away, and the high water extended far back over the Arkansas flats. Our little squad of five were still on the stern deck, trying to break off a large piece of siding. But, on account of a large white horse fastened to the railing on the stern deck and directly in the way, we did not succeed. Fleming had repeatedly asked us for God's sake to tell him what to do, that he could not swim. Our answer was, to avoid the big crowd and remain close to us. But when he saw that we were disappointed as to getting off the piece of siding, he rushed into the crowd going overboard and was never heard of afterward. The fire was close on to us, and we must soon leave the deck. Davis, Hill, and Wheeler were now with me, but a minute later they had disappeared I looked for something that would furnish a little support in the water but could not find anything. I climbed the stern railing and jumped as far as I could to avoid the crowd just below me. When I reached the top of the water, my head struck the boat. I had got turned in the water by coming in contact with drowning men. For a short time I was obliged to fight and keep out of the grasp of drowning men. Frequently I was pulled under, but always gained the top. I used my best efforts to get away from the boat, 
and when I saw I could get out near the stern, I worked fast to get away, when I was once more knocked under by some person jumping upon me. As I came to the top, a lady was beside me grasping me and calling for help. I managed to get away, but on getting a hold on some wreckage I returned and assisted her. Many others were near and around us calling for help. We were going toward the Arkansas side, and in course of time we left the burning boat quite a distance. Toward morning it became so dark we could see nothing before us. Men in different directions could be heard calling for help. All this time my lady companion was quiet, except that she would occasionally say, "'For God's sake, tell me, do you think we will be saved?' I said but little, as I was beginning to fear that we were a long distance away from anything on which to rest, as it was quite dark and I could see nothing ahead of us. All at once, however, my feet came in contact with brush. This encouraged me, and I worked fast, fearing if it was an island under water we might accidentally pass it. I now saw that we were among small trees and brush but my feet would not reach bottom. The current was sweeping over this island, and it carried us down. Fortunately, we were now within reach of a drift lodged against saplings. I soon discovered a log among the drift which I mounted. It sank partly, and I had no trouble in seating my companion. I held her with one hand, grasping the little tree next to me with the other. Our weight upon the log brought it down, and we were in the water to our shoulders. In a few minutes we became so chilled that we could scarcely speak. Soon it was daylight, and no one in sight who might rescue us from our dangerous position. Later in the morning two men in a river yawl came near, and were passing us, when someone behind us called to them to run in, as a man and woman were in the drift near him. They obeyed, and in a few minutes we were lying in the bottom of the boat. This gentleman who beckoned to the boatman to pick us up first is Comrade L. G. Morgan of Findlay, Ohio, for whom I have ever since had much regard. I have often met him since. We were taken to a shanty nearby where quilts and blankets were thrown over us, and we were placed in front of a fire. Several others were brought in soon after. George Hill of my company was among the number. He conversed with the lady, and while they were thus talking, she drew a ring from her finger, handed it to me, saying that all the valuables she had with her on the Sultana were lost, excepting that ring, and it was all she could at the time offer me as a token of reward. Later in the forenoon we were put on a steamer and taken to Memphis. On arriving here we separated. I was taken out to the soldiers' home, and the lady was no doubt taken care of by the doctors. At least I have never seen or heard from her since. Valmore Lambert of my company, who slept in the cabins directly over the boilers, was lost. John Davis, William Wheeler, and George Hill of my company were rescued. My post office address is Defiance, Ohio. End of section 65。section 66 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。section sixty six george a king enlisted as a private in company b second regiment tennessee cavalry and was enrolled on september first eighteen sixty two at blount county tennessee was captured in alabama while carrying a dispatch from athens alabama to general j d morgan near tuscumbia alabama on the tenth of october eighteen sixty four was sent to Meridian, Mississippi, thence to Cahaba, Alabama, and remained a prisoner until the spring of 1865. The destruction of the Sultana occurred near Memphis, Tennessee, April 27, 1865. 
I was sleeping on the top of the boat when the explosion awoke me, and I thought the boat was being fired upon by the enemy, but soon found what was the matter. I then stripped myself to try the water and went to the lower deck by a rope. I then went to the bow of the boat to get off. I thought that I would rather drown trying to save myself than to burn to death on the boat. After I got into the water, I was struck by a piece of timber which disabled me. I was then caught by someone, but managed to get loose. The water was a mass of men, some trying to make their escape and others drowning. I went some distance from the mass and then steered for shore. I think I could not have reached it but for four men passing by me on a plank. I caught hold of the plank and rested a little, then got on. We five made for the timber, which we reached in safety. We went some three miles down the river and caught on to a tree and climbed up. Just after we got up, five others landed there, though one was so weak he died in the water. We were taken on a boat about eight o'clock a.m. and were landed at Memphis. From Memphis we were taken to Camp Chase, Ohio, thence to Nashville, Tennessee. Was discharged from the United States Service June 14, 1865. Occupation Farmer. Have been Deputy Sheriff for the last four years for my county. Post Office Address, Tong, Blount County, Tennessee. End of section 66. Section 67 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 67. Hugh Kinzer. I was born in Leesburg, Ohio, on the 4th of October, 1836 enlisted in the service of the United States at Leesburg, Ohio, on the 16th of August, 1862, in Company E, 50th Ohio Volunteers. Was captured at the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, on the 30th of November, 1864, and taken to Cahaba, Alabama, where I remained until about the 15th of March, 1865, when I was sent to Vicksburg, Mississippi, to parole camp where I remained about six weeks, and then took passage on the steamer Sultana on the 24th of April, 1865. Landed at Memphis, Tennessee, on the evening of the 26th, and took supper at the soldier's home. The captain was very urgent that all should return soon so as not to be left. But, notwithstanding his orders, about two hundred failed to make their appearance, and were consequently left in Memphis, which, as the sequel proved, was a lucky thing for them. About two o'clock in the morning of the 27th, we pulled out of the coal yard, which is about seven miles above Memphis. The boat was very heavily laden, there being about 2,300 persons on board besides the freight. My messmate and myself occupied a position on the upper deck toward the bow of the boat, just outside of the banister. I was sleeping soundly when, suddenly, I was aroused by the noise of the explosion. I arose to my feet and saw that the smokestacks were both down. I looked below and saw that the boat was on fire. My comrade and I passed down to the lower deck, and the scene that met our eyes and the sounds that greeted our ears are beyond all description. My messmate, Johnny Carr, seized a board and said, I am going to try to get out of this, and then sprang into the water. I watched him as long as he was visible, but he failed to carry out his purpose, and must be numbered as one of the Sultana's victims. I was very weak from my long confinement in prison, but I was a very good swimmer and thought I would take my chances, so sprang into the water and swam a few yards when my strength deserted me so fast that I saw it would be of no avail to continue and turned back. A rope had been thrown over and was hanging by the side of the boat to which two or three poor fellows were hanging. I took hold of this rope and climbed above them. 
gradually the hold of each one lessened and they sank in the deep waters below my own grasp was becoming weak and i was sliding down the same way the others had done when a piece of board came floating down and with an effort i threw myself upon it and in an instant some one jumped upon me and said shove out of here by much tact we managed to steer clear of others who were trying to grasp at something to save themselves one more on the board would have meant death to us all the current carried us downstream very swiftly and the glare from the burning boat upon the water blinded us so we could not see the timber along the banks and in fact the water was so high at this time that the timber was overflowed we came to a bend in the river and were out of sight of the burning vessel when we discovered there was timber about five or six hundred yards ahead of us and turned to go to it at this point the swift current and dead water formed an eddy and we went whirling around as we were going around a person caught on to our board who said that she was a woman after going around once or twice she let go and floated down on her own board at the same time we floated out of this swift current and swam directly to the timber we succeeded in reaching a tree the top of which was out of the water and my companion climbed upon it while i swam to another one about twelve feet distant while swimming from the eddy to the tree my fingers caught in a substance which proved to be a pair of pants with suspenders on them this was a lucky find for me as i had divested myself of all unnecessary clothing before i jumped into the water when i reached the tree i was too much exhausted to lift myself upon it for some time we had floated about three miles down the river and it was now getting daylight giving me the opportunity of seeing the board which had proved to be so instrumental in saving my life it was a poplar board about eight feet long one foot wide and three-fourths of an inch thick my companion was in great distress as soon as he got out of the water and began to realize something of his condition he was so badly scalded that his face hands and whole body began to blister whether he is living or dead i know not i have never heard from him since the second morning when i left him in the hospital at memphis i do not know his name but his regiment was the sixtieth ohio volunteers while we were clinging to the tree we saw in the distance the hull of the sultana come floating down the river with a dozen or more boys still clinging to the burning wreck a mound of earth which had not been overflowed had formed a sort of island and several of the men from the wreck had floated down and lodged on it and as they discovered the men on the hull of the boat as it came floating down they quickly made a raft of logs and boards and went to their rescue from our position in the tree we watched them go trip after trip until the last man was rescued before they landed the last man on their return trip the hull of the sultana went down its hot iron sending the hissing water and steam to an immense height there were seven boats that came up the river to pick up the unfortunate they spied my companion and i perched in the tree and came to where we were there being a sufficient depth of water to make safe running we were taken back to memphis and placed in a hospital after a day or two of rest i resumed my journey homeward there are many incidents that are deeply fixed in my memory that occurred on that eventful morning but space forbids me to mention them but all of my war experiences of three years including camp march battle and prison there is nothing so fearful as that morning of terrors my present occupation is farming post office address albion nebraska end of section sixty seven Section 68 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 68. Henry J. Klein. 
I was born in Blackford County, Indiana, September 13, 1847, and enlisted in the service of the United States, December 17, 1863, in Company G, 9th Regiment, Indiana Cavalry. Was captured at Sulphur Branch Trestle, September 25, 1864, and confined in the Cahaba and Selma, Alabama prisons. At the time of the explosion of the Sultana, I was sleeping in front of the wheelhouse between comrades King and Downey of my company. Both were lost. Comrade Downey had sent home for money from Vicksburg. He went ashore at Memphis to see some friends, but the boat left him and he gave a man two dollars for bringing him in a skiff to the mouth of Wolf River, where the boat stopped to coal. When he lay down, he said, if I had not sent home for that money, I would have been left. I never heard him speak again. Comrade King sprang up at the first shock, exclaiming, Oh, God! Oh, Mother! I am lost! I am gone! I followed him across the boat, but lost sight of him. Our lieutenant, Swain, followed him in the river, still crying. Swain, a splendid swimmer, got him on a plank, and told him not to cry so, that he would take him out safe. King hushed and never spoke again, the lieutenant swimming behind and pushing him on. The plank in front of him came to a drift in the woods. He pushed Charlie up against the drift and told him to climb up, but he was too weak. Starvation, sickness, and the chill of the water had done their work, and as Swain swung around to get on the drift himself, he saw Charlie's hands go under it. But to go on with myself, at the time of the explosion I climbed down from the hurricane to the boiler deck and then divested myself of all my clothing except my cap, shirt, and drawers, and then sprang into the water on the lower side of the boat. It floated after me, and the flames burned my neck and ears. I came very near drowning. Our company had seventeen men on board, and eleven of them went down. Occupation, tile manufacturer. Post office address, Mill Grove, Indiana. End of section 68。section 69 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 69. John H. Koschendurfer. I was born in Lebanon County, Pennsylvania, on the 29th day of July, 1841, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Mansfield, Ohio, August 11, 1862, in Company D, 102nd Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry was captured at Athens, Alabama, September 24, 1864, and confined in the military prison at Cahaba, Alabama, till in March 1865, when I was taken to Camp Fisk, the United States and Confederate neutral camp, where I arrived on the 16th of that month. I, with others of my regiment, was placed on board the steamer Sultana, Five of us took up our positions outside the railing in front of the left wheel on the middle or cabin deck floor with a blanket apiece over us and our coats for pillows. We were outside and over the four great boilers, one of which caused the great destruction of lives and untold sorrow through so many of our northern homes. When the explosion occurred it threw the boiler out of its bed ascending and tearing its way through both cabin and hurricane decks. Those immediately over the boiler were thrown in every direction, some of them being thrown directly up and falling into the fiery chasm below, while those upon the side of the boat, like myself, were thrown directly out and away from the boat. The first I realized after the explosion, I found myself about three hundred feet from the boat, shrouded in total darkness and in what appeared to be an ocean of water. To say that I was dumbfounded would but faintly express my condition. But what was I to do, give up in despair and drown? 
No, never. As I arose to the surface and got full control of myself, I tried to isolate myself from those around me, and then took a survey of the situation. For a few minutes total darkness prevailed, then a small fire kindled itself, and there being no effort made to check this little flame, in a very short time it became a fierce conflagration, and the heat was intense, driving the men back, those in the center and nearest the fire crowding those on the outer edge into the river until all were driven off. The boat burned and sank when darkness again or all prevailed. But all this time, while the fire was doing its horrible work and the boat drifting with the current, I was about a hundred yards ahead floating downstream backwards and in a position to see the stern and one side of the boat where hundreds were dropping off into the river, the most of them going to their death. After watching them for a while I became quite composed and fully realized my situation, and in company with another poor fellow I started out to find shore, but failed. In our desperate effort, fighting the waves and current, we became separated, and I know not what became of him. Now I was alone, cold and tired. I began to look around for some support, which I found in the shape of an empty candle-box, which answered the purposes very well. This box I still had in my possession when picked up by a skiff eighteen miles below where the accident took place. I was brought back to Memphis and first put on a steamboat, where I took the first whiskey I drank while in the service of the United States. I was taken to Gayozo Hospital, at which place I remained some three weeks before I was able to be moved, on account of an injury to the lumbar region of my spine, by being thrown against a rope at the time of the explosion. I am a medical practitioner, residing at Galleon, Ohio. End of section 69《セクション70》of《Loss of the Sultana》by Chester D. Berry。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Section 70 — C. J. LaHue I was born in Harrison County, Indiana, March 5, 1846. Enlisted in the service of the United States at New Albany, Indiana, November 1863, in Company D, 13th Indiana Cavalry, and was captured at New Market, Alabama, September 30, 1864, and taken to and confined in the following prisons, viz. Cahaba, Andersonville, Meridian Stockade, and Selma, Alabama, and was paroled at Black River Bridge, Mississippi, and placed on the boat Sultana on the morning of April 24, 1865. This boat was destined for different points up the Mississippi River. Myself and three other comrades lay down to sleep in the rear of the pilot house on the Texas roof near the pilot house steps. About two o'clock a.m. the explosion occurred, killing the three comrades, Theodore Baker of Company B, 13th Indiana Cavalry, I do not remember the names of the other two, and leaving me the only surviving one that was on the Texas roof. I was thrown off the boat but caught hold of the railing of the banister and remained in that condition until driven off by the flames of the burning boat falling into the water on the upper side of the steamer as it swung around. The water was full of struggling and drowning people. I heard a lady crying for help, asking her husband to rescue her. She was holding to a rope attached to a mule that had got overboard. I also saw the husband with a little child on his back struggling in the water for a moment, then sinking. The lady cried out, "'My husband and baby are gone!' A comrade who had his limb crushed in the explosion by a door blown from the boat had the lady get on this door, through which means she was rescued. I was one of the last to leave the boat. It was burned to the water's edge. I swam down the river, 
and when opposite Memphis swam to some brush where I found a log to cling to. I remained there until daylight. A lady discovered me and pointed me out to the captain of a boat, saying there was a little boy on a log in the brush out on the river. The lady and two of the crew came in a boat and rescued me, and placed me on board the gunboat and wrapped me in blankets. I was not conscious of what was transpiring until the following evening. Was then placed in a hospital boat at Memphis. The lady who first discovered me in the brush took me to her own house and took care of me two weeks. Myself and forty-two others were sent north to Indianapolis, Indiana, and from there we went home. My present occupation is stock raising. Post office address, Great Bend, Kansas. End of section 70section 71 of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section 71 adam leak i was born in knox county tennessee april 15 1842 enlisted in the service of the united states at london kentucky on the 15th of november 1862 in company b third regiment tennessee cavalry and was captured at Sulphur Trestle, Alabama, September 1864, and confined in the Cahaba prison. I boarded the steamer Sultana at Vicksburg. When the explosion occurred, I was asleep on the cabin deck, outside the railing. Was knocked insensible by flying timbers and other missiles, and knew nothing until I found myself on the boiler deck near the wheelhouse. Then I realized a terrible calamity had occurred by seeing a perfect sea of people floundering in the water, some drowning, some grasping at objects, human and otherwise, all desperate at what seemed certain death. A horrible scene in the contemplation of which my own condition was forgotten. With others I reached the bow of the ill-fated vessel and was standing near the jackstaff when the wind veered and sent the flames in a solid mass against us, sending us in a body overboard. As I went over, I grasped the cables in a coil, and when going down continued to pay them out until I had secured a hold on their length that kept me above water and thus saved myself, as I could not swim at all. I remained in the water about three and one-half hours when the hull of the destroyed Sultana grounded on the Arkansas side, and myself and such comrades as hung on with me were rescued by means of old gunnels lashed together and extending to dry land a hundred yards away. The hull sank within five minutes after. My post office address is Knoxville, Tennessee. End of section 71 Section 72 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 72. Asa E. Lee. I was born in Galesburg, Illinois, April 14, 1847, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Clinton, Indiana, June 17, 1863, in Company A, 71st Regiment Indiana Volunteers, or 6th Indiana Cavalry. I was captured at Florence, Alabama, October 3, 1864, and taken to Meridian, Mississippi, where I was confined 61 days, and afterwards taken to Cahaba, Alabama, where I remained 140 days, or until about April 21, 1865 when I was taken to Vicksburg, Mississippi, for exchange. I, with others, was placed on board the steamer Sultana, and on the night of the terrible disaster was asleep on the hurricane deck near the pilot house with my bunkmate, John May, of Terre Haute, Indiana, a member of the 137th Regiment Indiana Volunteers, when the explosion took place. I was thrown to the forecastle, striking on my back and shoulders, and was severely bruised by the fall. 
I have never seen or heard from my bunkmate since the evening we closed our eyes in sleep just before we left Memphis, and I have met only three of the Sultana survivors since May 10, 1865. I left the boat while it was wrapped in flames, and after swimming nearly two miles I succeeded in getting on a log in the river, where I remained for about five hours, and was then taken up by the steamer Silver Spray and carried to Memphis, at which place I remained about six days, and was then sent north on the steamer Bell Memphis to Cairo, Illinois, and from there to Indianapolis. There were nine of my regiment on board the Sultana, of which six were lost. My present occupation is carpenter and builder, and my post office address is Tulare, California. End of section 72《Section 73 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Section 73 — Wesley Lee I bunked on the front part of the cabin deck, between the two stairways, and was asleep when the explosion took place. I sprang to my feet at the noise, and in doing so struck my head against the deck above, which had been smashed down and was supported by the railing around the stairs. I then crawled to the side of the boat and looked over the deck above. Just then the flame shot up from about the center of the boat with that crackling sound you all remember so well. I looked on the river at that terrible scene, a sea of heads. Oh, what a sight it was! It is just as vivid in my mind today as it was then. The hungry fire was fast eating toward me. Then I slid down a fender to a lower deck, took off my shoes, socks, blouse, and pants, tore two narrow pine boards from the center of the stairway, walked to the side of the boat and jumped off, starting for the Tennessee shore, and was making fine headway, as I supposed. However, on turning on my side to swim and so rest myself, in a short time the water was tumbling around me, and I looked for the shore, but it seemed as though it was farther away. I could just see it in the distance. Then I looked up the river and saw an island, but I was too far below to try to stem that fearful current. About this time I saw a steamboat coming down the river toward the burning wreck, but soon after I was left in darkness. A little incident happened just then. Some person who had got beyond the island came across in front of me, and in a firm and manly voice said, "'Don't take hold of me.' I answered, "'I will not, as we have plenty of room.' I mention this, for if he is living, I would like to know who he is and where he is. He passed to the rear and was soon out of sight. After I had been in the water a long time and making poor headway, I became satisfied that the current was running to the other side of the river, but would it do to change my course? I concluded not to, for perhaps the river would soon make a turn and then the current would favor me. I was beginning to feel very cold and put forth every effort to reach the shore, keeping my boards in such a position that the current running against them would draw towards the shore. The voices of those in the river were in the rear, and I began to make a little headway, and soon the lamps in the city became visible. Then I worked all the harder, but it was necessary for I was getting colder all the time. The thought of home, however, together with the determination of a soldier to live as long as he can, bore me up. When I came in front of the wharf boat, two men came out with a lantern, and I called for help. One of them jumped in a skiff and was soon by my side, took me in, and in a short time I was by a fire in the wharf boat, where I was given some clothing. Then they asked me what the matter was, and when I informed them that the Sultana had blown up and her crew was in the water, the telegraph operator went to his instrument, and in a few minutes a steamer was moving out and picking up men. By the time I was well warmed, 
the steamer General Boynton came to the wharf boat and put off some men it had just picked up. Then the telegraph operator came to me and asked if I cared about being mentioned as the person who gave the information of the disaster, as it would do me no good, and the rivermen would get pay for it. I told him it made no difference to me, but I see by some articles in the National Tribune that the steamer General Boynton gave the news, which is not correct. Post Office Address Winston, Missouri End of Section 73section seventy four of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section seventy four thomas c love alias thomas long i was born in providence rhode island january thirteenth eighteen forty three enlisted in the united states navy my second term at chicago november fourth eighteen sixty four for two years or during the war i was sent to the ironclad essex stationed at memphis tennessee was rated quartermaster and was on watch at the time the steamer sultana left the wood dock about half a mile above the essex and was near the mouth of wolf river the sultana left the wood dock about two o'clock in the morning of april twenty seventh eighteen sixty five and steamed up the river at twenty minutes of three she blew up at a point seven miles above memphis and at twenty minutes past three i heard the cries of drowning men calling for help i reported to our captain john atchinson and he jumped out of bed and ordered all hands called all boats manned and to be away and save all that we could i had charge of one of the boats the skylark and helped to save seventy-six of the men from a watery grave, and when all our boats were gone except the market boat, called the dinghy, our six messenger boys took it and saved the only woman that was saved who was on board the Sultana. The people of Memphis sent us a barrel of whiskey in the morning, but our first lieutenant, William Berry, broke in the head of the barrel and poured the contents onto the deck. The firemen and coalmen that were left on board caught the whiskey in buckets as it ran down the scuppers, and some got quite jolly, whereas, if it had been served out to the men as was intended, there would not have been any one drunk. The men in the boats worked hard without any breakfast, and then we hunted for those that had strayed off into the swamps, trying to get to the dry land. All that day we found men almost dead hanging to the trees about two miles out into the river, and among those that I rescued was one man so badly scalded that when I took hold of his arms to help him into the boat, the skin and flesh came off his arms like a cooked beet. I lost my hold on him, but soon caught him again, and with help he was got into the boat and saved from a watery grave. I heard of the reunion of the survivors of the Sultana that was held at Adrian, April ninth, 1890, and went to see if I could meet with any of those whom I saved, and had the pleasure of taking the above-described man by the hand. It was with a grip that did not slip, as when I went to pull him into the boat. I met another man that I picked up from a bale of hay. There were nine trying to hold to it and a piece of log. I saw twenty-one men on one log that was drifting in the river. I took off part of them and called another boat that took the rest. I was through all of the war, this being my second term, but the horror and sufferings of that morning I never saw approached. Pen cannot write or describe it, tongue cannot tell, and mind cannot picture the despair of twenty-three hundred scalded and drowning men in a cold deep river on a dark night with the current running twelve miles an hour and those men just released from prison not half fed nor quarter clothed they did not have the strength to battle with a trial like that it was the most heart-rending scene that i ever witnessed 
I hope to never see the like again. My present occupation is that of general merchant, and my post office address is Clayton, Michigan. End of section 74「Section 75 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 75. William Luganbeel. Enlisted in the service of the United States as a private in Company F of the 135th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry at Columbus, Ohio, May 2, 1864 was captured at North Mountain, West Virginia, July 3, 1864, and was taken to Andersonville, Georgia, July 27, 1864, remained in the stockade until October 1, 1864. I went out on parole of honor and helped build six sheds on the south side of the prison. My quarters were near the depot and I could go a mile from my quarters without any guard. When I got out of prison, I weighed only a hundred pounds, but when I was on my homeward trip, I weighed one hundred and thirty-six pounds, so much for stealing sweet potatoes and peanuts. March twenty-seventh, 1865, I left Andersonville and was sent to the Black River, Mississippi, for exchange, and thence to Camp Fisk, which is two miles back of Vicksburg, where I remained about three weeks while here president lincoln was assassinated we then went on board the steamer sultana and on the evening of april twenty sixth we landed at memphis tennessee while there i laid down to sleep they took on coal and started again for god's country went about seven miles when i was awakened by a terrible roar and crash i was on the second deck my partner's name was Joseph Test, from Dayton, Ohio. A piece of timber ran through his body, killing him almost instantly. I tried to help him, but could not. Then I went downstairs, and the like I never saw and hope I never will again. The boat was now on fire. Reader, imagine you are on a burning boat with 2,100 men on a dark night. What do you think you would do? Well, I will tell you what I did. On board the boat was a pet alligator. He was kept in the wheelhouse. It was a curiosity for us to see such a large one. We would punch him with sticks to see him open his mouth, but the boatman got tired of this and put him in the closet under the stairway. When I came downstairs, every loose board, door, window, and shutter was taken to swim on and the fire was getting very hot. I thought of the box that contained the alligator, so I got it out of the closet and took him out and ran the bayonet through him three times. While I was doing this, a man came to me and said the box would do for he and I both to get out on. My intention was to share it with him, but I did not speak, and I do not know what became of him. I took off all my clothing except my drawers, drew the box to the end of the boat, threw it overboard, and jumped after it, but missed it and went down somewhere in the mighty deep. When I came up I got hold of the box, but slipped off and went down again. When I arose to the surface again I got a good hold of it and drew myself into it with my feet out behind so that I could kick the edges of the box coming under each arm, as it was just wide enough for my breast and my arms coming over each edge of the box. So you see, I was about as large as an alligator. There were hundreds of men in the water, and they would reach for anything they could see. When a man would get close enough, I would kick him off, then turn quick as I could and kick someone else to keep them from getting hold of me. They would call out, don't kick, for I am drowning. But if they had got hold of me, we would both have drowned. It was about six miles from land. While the boat was burning, we could see the trees on the shore, and kept our heads that way, and swam fast as we could, 
but the boat burned down, sank, and left us in utter darkness. We could not tell which way to go, and it was a very lonesome place to be in. Now I would only try to steady my box when I would get in those whirls as I floated down the river. I can speak of seeing two men after I started on my voyage. It was now very dark, and I could see an object only a few feet. The first man I met in the darkness, that lonely night, as he was passing me, said, "'Here goes your old tugboat.' I did not answer him, as I had tug enough of my own. The next man that came near me asked which way we were going. He asked me a third time, and said that he believed that we were going right down, meaning we were floating down the river." I was taken up three miles below Memphis by a gunboat called the Essex, and was taken from there to the Gayoso Hospital, was put in Ward A, remained there some days, drew clothing, and got on board the Bell of St. Louis, came to Cairo, Illinois, and then to Columbus, Ohio. Present address? Perryton, Licking County, Ohio. End of section 75